A reading from St. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. Just as the body is one and has many members and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the one spirit we are all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we are all made to drink of one spirit. Indeed, the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot would say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear were to say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many members, yet one body. So the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the members of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable, and those members of the body that we think less honorable we clothe with greater honor. And our less respectable members, I'll let you interpret what he means by that, our less respectable members are treated with greater respect, whereas our more respectable members do not need this. But God has so arranged the body, giving the greater honor to the inferior member, that there may be no dissension within the body, but the members may have the same care for one another. So if one member suffers, all suffer together with it, and if one member is honored, all rejoice together with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then deeds of power, then gifts of healing, forms of assistance, forms of leadership, various kinds of tongues. Are all prophets? Are all apostles? Are all teachers? This is about like asking, are all priests? Are all bishops? Are all deacons? Answer is no. Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret those tongues? The answer, again, implied is no. So Paul says, strive for the greater gifts. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people, and hear what St. Paul is saying in perhaps his most wisest, most wisest, his wisest of wisdom teachings. fall down. Thank you very much. Okay. The joys of preaching to a tablet. Mm-hmm. It's a weird time to be a priest, my friends. <laughs> that is what it is. Anyways, none of this is relevant to anything. Yeah, yeah. So, one of those days. Here we go. <laughs> As you've noticed, I am currently at the church in my office, and I'm not recording from the sanctuary. Why? Because according to my computer screen, it says that it is five degrees outside, which means that the sanctuary is just a tad, tad on the chilly side to today. And rather than cranking the heat up for a 15 minute ish sermon, actually, this one's probably going to be closer to 20, just, just to warn you, um, just to, to waste money and, and, and Mother Earth's valuable resources. I thought I could uh, record this sermon from the relative warmth of my office. 
If anybody's greatly offended that I'm not recording from the sanctuary, well, these days you have the luxury of being able to turn me off. Um, it is what it is. Also, I can drink coffee <laughs> while I preach, uh, which is fun. So, anyhow, the name of this sermon is called The Image of God. What does it mean for us to be made in the image of God? The opening chapter of the Hebrew Bible, the opening book of Genesis, the opening chapter of that book of Genesis, after all, tells us that we human beings are made in God's image. So I'm assuming if this information is coming to us like right from the get-go, it's probably something that's pretty important for us to, you know, figure out, to grapple with. But what exactly does this mean, that we are made in the image of the divine? Well, right out of the gate, <clears throat> the earliest Christians, they were not at all shy in proclaiming that God is love. So it would make an awful lot of sense to say that people are born with the capacity to love if God is love and we're made in God's image, right? And it's a very nice thought. But again, it, what does it mean? What are we saying by this? Are we merely saying that God feels love because most of us equate love with a feeling? Or are we saying that God does loving things because others of us like to think of love as a verb, as an action? Is this what we're saying? Are we simply saying that human beings have been created with the capacity to feel loving feelings and to do loving things? Is this what it means to be made in the image of God? I don't think so. And here's why. Because if you, if you think about it, if this were true, it would mean that the image of God in us would be contained only to our feelings and our actions and nothing more. And the problem with this way of thinking is that the entirety of your being your personhood, it wouldn't be made in the image of God, but only certain parts of you would be. <laughs> the parts that can act and the parts that can feel. And I don't know about you, but I feel like the image of God should somehow be more all-encompassing than this. And that love should be about something more than just our feelings and actions, imitating God's feelings and actions, right? I mean, think about this. Think about the first time that you fell in love, head over heels in love. Or think about your wedding day, if you've ever been married. As you were losing yourself in your beloved's lovely eyes, in your beloved's embrace, was it just your feelings and actions that were impacted? Or did like all of you <laughs> get wrecked, disrupted, right? Was it just feelings and actions that were impacted? Or did you find that every ounce of your entire being was completely enraptured and eclipsed by this love? You get my gist here? Were you head over heels in love? Or were you just like actions over feelings in love? It seems to me that we need a deeper definition of love if we're going to get at the heart of what it means to be made in the image of God, this God who is love. Well, from the very beginning, the church also defined what it meant whenever it boldly made the claim that God is love. Early Christians taught that God is love because God exists as a mysterious communion of persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In other words, the phrase, God is love, is synonymous with the phrase, God is Trinity. In a really, really fascinating writing from the ancient church, St. Gregory Nazianzus, he, ex <clears throat> excuse me, he explains why we Christians call God Father, or at least he explained why ancient Christians called God Father. And he articulates something that most of us in the church, I think, clearly have never ever thought about. Here's what he said. He said that we call God Father, not because God mirrors what earthly fathers feel or what earthly fathers do. No, he said. 
we call God Father because you cannot think of a father without also thinking of that father's child. In other words, the very notion of fatherhood implies a relationship. A father cannot be a father if that father has never fathered a child, whether biologically or through adoption. And the same would be true, he says, of the Son of God. The very notion of sonship implies a relationship. A son cannot exist if they don't have a parent, whether biological or adopted. <clears throat> you cannot think of a son without thinking of a father. So in other words, you cannot think about God the Father apart from Jesus the Son, nor can you think about Jesus the Son apart from God the Father. God's very being is relationship. And this means that God the Father does not exist first and then relate to the Son and the Holy Spirit. No. God the Father's being is his relationship with the Son and the Holy Spirit. This, my friends, is what the earliest Christians meant whenever they said that God is love. God doesn't just do loving things or feel loving feelings. He does that too, but it's deeper than this. His very existence is love. His very existence defines love. So then what does this mean for those of us who are made in God's image? It means that in a way that mysteriously echoes the Trinity, we also find our being in relationship. Now, I know this will be a paradigm shift for most of us, but follow my line of thought here. It'll, it'll click. Without countless protons and electrons and neutrons being in relationship to one another in your body, and without molecules weaving themselves together to form the biological tapestry that is your body, and without 30 to 40 trillion cells coming together in a complex network of relationships within your body, and without your organs, like, relating to each other in the way that they do in your body, yeah, you straight up just would not exist. You wouldn't be here. Your existence is a relationship of particles, molecules, cells, and organs. Your existence is a relationship. Furthermore, without your parents coming together in the way that they did, yeah, you wouldn't be here either. Don't dwell on that one too much. The point is, your existence is prefaced by the relationship of your parents. And without your social relationships, your uniquely charming and incredibly dashing personality would not be what it is today. How you have reacted to people in your past, it shapes you. And it makes you who you are today to the people in your present. I mean, past love has probably shaped you for the better right, has made you feel whole, whereas past trauma has deflated you and has probably shaped you for the worse, right, especially if you haven't processed or dealt with that trauma. People really do have a hand in shaping who we are. Life is relationship. And if gravity did not relate to the planet in the way that it does, and if the ozone layer didn't relate to the planet in the way that it does, and if the Earth itself wasn't specifically located where it is in relationship to the other planets and the sun, like, you would not exist. Nor would I, nor would life on this planet. Period. The point, again, all of life is relationship. Life is irreducibly relationship. Life is a cosmic tapestry of interconnectedness. In a word, life is love. Existence is love. And we don't exist first like God the Father and then relate to other people and things because apart from those other people and things, yeah, we would not exist to begin with. And just as it is with God, so beautifully and mysteriously put, like life also is communion for us. I mean, most people don't know this, but it's, which is tragic. But even the English word for person, the word that we get the English word for person from, it originally meant that I have my face turned towards somebody or something else. To be a person means to be in relationship. It means to be turned towards something other 
than yourself, turned outward in relationship to something. Now, the problem is that those of us who have been indoctrinated into the ways of Western culture, which is pretty much like all of us, right? We live out most of our lives pretending that none of this, none of what I've just said is true whenever it comes to God or the world or human beings. We've blinded ourselves to the countless relationships that actually make us what we are and who we are. We deny our personhood in that we turn our faces away from other people and things, and we focus our gaze exclusively upon ourselves. My friends, if there is such a thing as sin, this is it. Because it's nothing less than the failure to understand and to actualize the image of God within us, or within other people for that matter. For we believe today that we are self-made, self-contained individuals. We pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps and we get the job done on our own, right? We deny just how much everything and everyone else around us contributes to our being. And as a result, we treat other people and animals and plants and Mother Earth and even God as objects of consumption as means to an end, and not as those things that play an important role in making us who we are. And we don't realize just how much cutting ourselves off from others, cutting ourselves off from others, and just how much entrenching ourselves in our own egos, we don't realize just how much this is obliterating us individually and socially and politically. For if life itself is relationship, the more we blind ourselves to this, the more we fail to live into it, and the more we fail to find our true selves and what life is really all about. For it's only in communion, in relationship, that we discover our deepest selves and the universe's deepest wisdom. I need a coffee break. <laughs> I mean, is not all of this exactly what St. Paul is trying to get us to wrap our heads around this morning? It's in the context of the church, he says, that people are meant to discover that their existence is like what a hand's existence is or what a foot's existence is in a relationship to the rest of a body. We're all intertwined, just as parts of a body are intertwined, connected. Paul says that if everyone was a foot or a hand or an ear or an eye, there would be no such thing as the body, right? It would just be a bunch of parts disconnected. And these body parts, they can only exist if they are in relationship with one another. This is a no-brainer, right? So if we try to cut ourselves off from others and tell them that we don't need them, it would be like your head saying to your feet, yeah, I don't need you. I'm good on my own. Thank you very much. And if we go ahead and decapitate ourselves off from the rest of the body, this will only end in disaster. Like, I don't think I need to tell you that a head just cannot survive <laughs> without a body, nor can a body survive without a head. Both things need to be present and connected tangibly, physically, <laughs> in order for the thing, the whole thing, you know, to survive. So what Paul is saying is that the more we attempt to sever ourselves off from others, out of the shame of not feeling good enough or out of the pride of feeling that others are not good enough, the more we end up, in the long run, damaging both ourselves and others. And instead of finding ourselves and discovering our own uniqueness shoulder to shoulder with other people, we only end up losing ourselves and conforming ourselves to everyone else who has also lost themselves. Um, much of the American mentality and the American way is just straight up a lie. Like entrancing yourself in your own individuality and your own ego, this is not self-discovery, my friends, but the furthest thing from it. 
While we may believe that we are breaking out of conformity with others and discovering our true selves, all we are doing is conforming ourselves to the self-centeredness of the human ego. And there is nothing special, nothing unique, or nothing self-actualizing about this whatsoever. My friends, it's one thing to believe all of what I've just said. <laughs> In theory, in what St. Paul says, in theory, it's another thing entirely to be enlightened by it and to live from it. It's one thing to believe that all of life is relationship. It's another thing entirely to let your personhood find its rest in the life that is relationship. After 2,000 years of Christianity, we have yet to fully grapple with the implications of this very orthodox, traditionally rooted, Trinitarian, and human vision. If what the Church Fathers have said is true, and what the creeds say are true, then it would mean, most of all, that people are not means to an end, but they are ends in and of themselves. So any and every single time we in the church seek to use people as means to an end, treating them more as dogmatic receptacles than human beings, treating them more as numbers in pews than human beings, treating them more as offering plates than human beings, treating them more as political catalysts than human beings, we are only oppressing the image of God in them and suppressing the image of God within ourselves. And every, every single time we divide ourselves along national and political and racial and ideological and theological and dogmatic and gender and sexual and generational lines, we are failing, failing to live into God's image. And we are diminishing the capacity of those around us to discover their true personhood, the image of God within themselves. Any time, to borrow St. Maximus the Confessor's very wise words, any time we make division out of difference, any time we make division out of diversity, we are failing to live into our personhood, failing to reflect God's image. The time has come for us in the church to quit baptizing and christening the American ideal of an individualism. And we need to start calling it out for what it is. An impasse. A dead end whenever it comes to the quest for human fulfillment, happiness, and self-discovery. Individual, individualism is not the way. And we need to recover a deeper sense of the church a deeper vision for the church. My friends, the church is not an institution. She is not a conglomeration of like-minded individuals. She's not a religion. She is not a spiritual social club. She is the fulfillment of all being. She is the crossroads of the entire cosmos. She is the place where personhood is fulfilled. She is communion, as God is communion. She is love as God is love. We should settle for nothing less than this vision, this way of being. It's time for us in the church to become what we are, the unveiling of God's way of being in the world.